Hey, what's going on? It's Chris Carino. This is the Voice of the Nets podcast, continuing with our series on uh, some of the players we see going forward with this team that were with the team last year. We're joined by Lucas Kaplan of Nets Daily. We're joined by the capper, Tim Capstraw, my partner of many, many, many years on the radio. Um, in fact, I think, I think with the exception of uh, Mike Breen and Clyde Frazier, we are the Longest running duo in New York sports broadcast. How about that? How about that? First year that I did the Nets, I worked one year with Kelly Trapuca. When, when I, as the full time guy, past I worked with Albert King, the great Albert King. But I was watching a podcast, Capper, and you know when Kelly went over to TV. That's when you came in to be my partner. It's lasted all these years, twenty three years later. Um. I'm watching a podcast with Dan Soder, who's a a comedian who a lot of people might know from the show Billions, uh, and and he's and he's he's got uh, Robert Eiler on his podcast, who's the the kid who played AJ Soprano, and and uh, Soder's a big basketball guy, so he likes to sometimes open trading cards with his guests, and he's opening up, and I sent you the clip. Yeah. He opens up, they get they get a Kelly Chapuka card, and they go, they're pronouncing his name Trapaka, and they never heard of the guy. Which, if you're a basketball fan, I'm sorry, Lucas Kaplan, you're not much, you're you're a twenty some odd year old guy. You know who Kelly Chapuka is. I do. I do. Yeah. I do. That's- Although I can't say that I would expect many basketball fans my age that are not as passionate to know maybe i should yeah i just think that they're they're playing themselves off as real nba guys and i love those two guys but like you're aj soprano kelly chapuka is from jersey True. he was an all-star two times two times two time all-star. all-star see look at that lucas had his numbers right off the bat yeah i just i know because he's one of the few uh answers to the trivia question uh Rookie year All-Stars. That I remember. There you go. Great player to Notre Dame. Great player out of New Jersey. Le- New Jersey legend. NBA star. And was probably calling games on TV, Lucas, when you were just when you were in your formative years becoming an F fan. Real formative so. years, yes. I just I just felt the need to to stand up and defend my former partner. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And and thank goodness they didn't have Spinarkle. They could have really had an adventure <laughs> with that name. <laughs> whose numbers retired in Philadelphia, by the way. It's just retired for Charles Barkley. But <laughs> it's still technically his number that he wore with the Sixers is retired in Philadelphia now. Hey, um, I go back to his final four, final four, uh, or regional MVP, Jim Spinarkle, too, at, at Duke. That's for sure. With mm-hmm. gray hair still. Uh, and one of the best uh, television analysts out there. And and, 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 and speaking hair, the beard you got to keep. I've decided you've got to keep it. You, 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 that looks great. It's growing on you. Uh, No pun intended. Very good. (laughs) It's growing on you, but (laughs) yes, thank you. Um, one of the great human interest stories and everything we had last year was uh, on this net team was with Dorian Finney-Smith. And his dad, right, being reunited. His dad had uh, been in prison. Um, it was a process of, of getting him out that was started when he was in Dallas and, and with Mark Cuban. It continued even when he was with the Nets, the, the, the Mavericks personnel who had, who had done the groundwork on that. It kept it going. And then finally, Dorian Finney-Smith, dad, got to see him play in an NBA game in person for the first time. Um had to be an emotional year for Dorian Finney Smith. And not only that, he ends up, you know, having some injuries, but also having his name thrown around where he thinks he's going to get traded at the deadline. It's understandable if Dorian Finney Smith had an up and down year last year. And it and it's ended up really what happened. Um, but I do know this, when the Nets traded Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant, they were trying to acquire assets, right, that can, they can build on going in the future. They've already turned one of those assets, Mikel Bridges, into a haul in draft picks. 
Uh, we talked about it in the past with Cam Johnson. He could be another asset that they turn into something that fits more of their timeline. And Dorian Finney-Smith may be the same, same type of player. Another player who, on a really good team, maybe doesn't fit the net timeline right now, but on a very good team, Dorian Finney-Smith, is an invaluable role player, Cap. Well, that, that's why so many people were inquiring about him last year. I mean, he is the ideal role player, tough guy, that and winning guy, uh, high character, can make the corner three. Can make he he's a winning player, and uh, so many people inquired. I think that will happen again this year. But if for some reason it doesn't, he falls into that category of the most perfect. A perfect uh, example for young players that an organization could have. So uh, I don't think the Nets can go wrong either way. Yeah, if you're developing young players like the Nets are trying to do, he's a a terrific guy to be on the bus with you, be on the plane with you, be in that locker room. And and Lucas, you pointed out in your great film breakdown on him on uh, on all the Nets uh, social media outlets and digital outlets and digital platforms. um, He he's he had an interesting year too because he gets not only his role changes but his position changes. He's a guy that can, you know, is is counted on at times to do a lot of things that you thought were out of his skill set, but his numbers proved otherwise. Yeah, when Nick Claxton went down with the early season um, ankle injury, I believe uh, he stepped up as you know, kind of your small ball five. And really, the Nets played some of their best basketball of the season when he was in that role. And like we saw them do a lot of switching, a lot of stuff you'd expect them to do with Dorian at center. But he was like playing drop coverage. He was guarding Nikola Vucevic. I remember that in-season tournament game in Chicago. Yeah. And I just thought it really exemplified the type of guy you're getting in Doe that he's going to do whatever and do it to the best of his ability and is a valuable basketball player as well. Like he was picking and popping and some of the slower, bigger centers in the league couldn't really keep up with him when he's right. And he's, you know, as you said, had to deal with some injuries last year. He's a guy that is going to improve your strength, your length on the glass. When he's playing the wing position, he can slide over to the five. He can hit threes. Uh, as a coach, you're always going to feel safe when, when he's on the court. Toward the end of the year, I think it, and it coincided with Kevin Ollie taking over. Um, I thought we saw a difference in, in the attitude of Dorian Finney-Smith. And I thought that, you know, he and, man, and I don't know inside, I don't have inside information if he was challenged by Kevin Ollie or whatnot. Or, but I, do you remember this, Cabra? I mean, I think as soon as yeah. Kevin took over, it was like we saw – a, a switch turned back on in Dorian Finney-Smith. Uh, uh, yes, yes. It was, uh, listen, obviously, you know, we don't, we're not privy to conversations, but if you were reading about the fact that he could, you know, that a lot of teams are interested in him, uh, what is Dorian Finney-Smith hearing? You know, he's hearing a lot more of that, that information throughout the entire season. But you're right. Kevin Alley kind of hit him on a personal level about personal pride. And he was, if you ever heard, you know, listening to Kevin Ollie before the games, I, I really enjoyed it. I thought he'd really, if you're the certain type of guys, he could hit home with and really be motivational. And I thought he really connected with Dorian and uh, got him back to playing at the level he needed to play. So you're right. It bookended, right? I mean, the beginning of the year, he was on fire, making all sorts of play, 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 play you know, a lot, a lot of shots at the five as a trailer, pick and pop. And then at the end of the year, he played well in the middle. There's a lot going on right there, but uh, man, I mean, I feel like I've said this a lot, but you know, he he is the ultimate uh, guy that other teams are going to want. That's for mm-hmm. sure. Ironically, probably the missing piece in Dallas last year that yeah. that that yeah. you know a team that went to the finals that had traded him to the Nets to get Kyrie Irving, and you know Kyrie Irving played a big role in that Dallas team, but they certainly could have used a guy with Dorian Finney Smith's skill set. Um, going forward and I think that's something to keep an eye on in terms of an asset the Nets have knowing that that guy's out there that the teams could use I, I remember when he got traded to the Nets you know Chuck Cooperstein longtime radio voice of the Dallas Mavericks I, I I was texting with him after the trade and you know he just he couldn't say enough incredible things about Dorian Finney-Smith and when we went back to Dallas it was the first road game of the year last year uh, right? I mean right. big deal yeah. uh, I mean everybody just it, 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 they they couldn't get enough 
of his of of just wanting to seek him out and you could how many hugs he was given in that arena you could tell again going back to character going to how much people uh really relished him being around and i think that's been the case with the nets and we'll see now you know again his future going forward but um he's also a guy that i when it, when it comes to his you know we 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 thrown that a lot out in this series you know uh ceiling and floor you know Dorian Finney-Smith, kind of this many years in the league, I think you know what he is. But I do think he's got potential to be a more consistent three-point shooter. I think we saw in his time with the Nets, he's been very inconsistent with the three. And it's and sometimes it's been just obvious stuff. Like when he first got to the Nets, right, the shot was flat. There was no arc to his jump shot. And then we talked to him last year in, in, in training camp, and he was like, yeah, you know, I really – it was obvious. I, I got to get more arc on my shot. Became a little bit more consistent. So I think he's one of those guys that the dirty work kind of stuff, you know you're always going to get with him. The, the skill stuff, you got to be on him about, about doing it, it the, the technique and, and, and getting him more consistent, I think. Yeah, and I mean, the he numbers was coming probably off- back that up. He was coming off three near 40% three-point seasons in Dallas before the year in which he got traded to the Nets. And if you remember when he came over that year, he was dealing with – he had to get surgery on his pinky finger on his right hand last offseason. And so he shoots 35% last year. You can maybe look forward to – there's there's a lot of reason to think that number will keep improving. He shoots – you know. 30% 30% his first half season with Brooklyn when he has essentially a broken finger, torn ligaments in his finger, shoots 35% the next year, uh, just based on his history, based on the injury, based on his work ethic, you know, there's reason to hope slash expect that to keep improving for him. I remember, he was a guy that his three-point shooting average increased his first six years in the league mm-hmm. every single year it was an interesting stat like that. What stands out to me is he started attacking closeouts better as the year went on. A number yeah. of people would close out to the corners on him. He'd shot fake, get it. Well, in because there, for a long he, time there, he, he was leading the league in corner threes, right? Right. So that's going to draw right. those so closeouts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So he started attacking them. I thought more effectively making plays, uh, Again, he's a he's he's a quality player for a really good team. And if you're if you're the Nets right now and you're building, he's a quality player, also quality person, quality player. So, yeah, yeah. I, one just one interesting, I guess, uh, uh, stat for him is that there's really hasn't been a drop off in his corner threes and his above the break threes in his career. And we saw that last year, like teams still close out on him when he's above the arc and that's where he had a lot of pump fake one dribble layup or one dribble you know he's really good at those kind of dump off passes to a big um so it's not like you know obviously he's had incredible corner three-point shooting seasons and that's valuable but it's not a case where oh like he he's a non-threat from above the arc which is obviously pretty valuable the value on a defensive end, though, we're, we're not talking enough about that. He, he just is, he's got a physicality about him. He's outstanding on the ball, off the ball, multiple positions. You can switch anybody onto him. And he plays with a physicality uh, winning player. People, people are going to go after him. Yeah, toughness. I mean, that's yep. just when you, when the first thing I think of is just there's a toughness about him um, that, yeah, it come, it, it, it it rubs off on the defensive end, but certainly it's, it's infectious. You know, when, when Dorian yep. Finney Smith is, is diving on the floor and he's rebounding and he's making shots, like it, it affect everybody on the team. I mean, he's one of those guys that really, when he's going has a positive effect on everybody that he plays with. Yeah. Yeah. Over the year and a half, he's been in Brooklyn. Uh, something I don't think that is talked about as much is that when Brooklyn switches and we know Nick Claxton can switch and you want him doing that, they are uh, a markedly better defensive rebounding team with him on the court because he's long physical and willing to do the dirty work of, okay, my big is switched out. Let me crack back to the paint, put a body on someone that's bigger than me. And so his impact shows up in ways, you know, you just kind of have to dig for, but there's a reason I think as Capper said, all these teams calling about his trade availability 
I think 30 NBA teams would gladly take him uh, on their roster. Well, they were they were throwing trade offers out at Sean Marks the, before he'd even put on a net uniform. Mm-hmm. You know, the minute he got to Brooklyn, people were trying to get him. So again, it's about acquiring assets. And then in this case, not so much developing an asset. I think he's, he's the guy that, that he's always been and he's continued to get better. And, you know, but again, in making him more valuable as an asset or as a, as an asset of in that locker room and being a part of this net team going forward. And you talked about Lucas's versatility defensively. Again, Jordy Fernandez, the big thing about this team going forward, how are they going to play? You know, how are they going to play on the defensive end? It's yeah. been a debate for a number of years right now. Ever since, you know, Nick Claxton, Jared Allen, those kind of guys have been man in the middle. Are they, should they be a drop team? Well, because you have Claxton and you have Dorian Finney-Smith and they can switch everything. Are you better off doing that? But then how, overall, what are the numbers effectively? You know, the thing is, even with Dorian Finney-Smith and Nick Claxton and guys that, and, and Mikkel Bridges, right? They've had guys with defensive reputations, but it hasn't translated into good defensive numbers or at least not the kind that you think when you look at the reputations of guys. So how do we balance that, I guess, is what we're going to see this year. Great point. Great point. And I think that's, uh, I don't think it's going to be about that. Jordy Fernandez's challenge is not going to be the strategic things. Everybody kind of plays drop. They play, they play up to the level. They'll, They'll blitz. They'll do whatever everybody does. It's how well you do it and how hard you do it and how consistently hard you do things will be the challenge for Jordy Fernandez with this net team defensively. Definitely. All right, good look at Dorian Finney-Smith going forward as we analyze and break down these uh, these players that played a part in the net season last year and will be playing another role that's vital this year going into the 24-25 season. Thanks to Lucas Kaplan, Nets Daily. And always with you daily on the Nets radio broadcast. It's Tim Capstra. I'm Chris Carino. Thank you so much. Subscribe. Give us a good rating if you like. This is the Voice of the Nets.